Good morning, Cornerstone. We are so glad that you're here with us to worship the Lord this morning. And, you know, we may not be in the same building, but our hearts are connected together. So as we sing and as we lift up our praise this morning, let's remember that it is for him and him alone. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we love you so much. And we just thank you for this time that you've given us to come into your house, God. And we just pray now that you'll still us and quiet us, God, and, and help us to remove the distractions that try to pull our attention away from you, God. And in this time and the places that we find ourselves, God, just help us to truly pour out our worship on you, Father. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen.
Father, we thank you today that it is well with our soul. No matter what you're doing in our world, God, we know you're doing it for your glory and for our good. We have the confidence that your word gives us. It lets us know that no matter what, God, all things work together for good for those that love the Lord. It didn't say, God, that all things were good. It says all things work for good. And that's why, God, it's well with our soul. Whatever you're doing, it's well with
to come forward to receive our morning tithes and offerings, but you can still do that. Take out your phone and go to your Givelify app. Or if you can't do that, stop by the church at some point this week. Give of your tithes and your time and your gifts. We are called to do that as our act of worship. And it's also a token of our appreciation to our Father, who has so richly blessed us with all things. We thank you for joining us again, and now we're going to turn it over to Pastor Steve for the Word.
morning, and thank you so much for joining us today as we worship King Jesus. I, my, my joy and hope is today that you uh, join with the worship team as they led us in worship today. Uh, though you might not have known the song or you might not have been able to sing along because there were no lyrics on the screen, my prayer is that your heart engaged with God. Because, you know, that's really what worship is, is you expressing to God through that medium of singing a love that you have for him because of everything that he's done for you. And I get it, you know, obviously worship is a little different these days because we're not all in the same room. But, you know, when we all join together, no matter whether we're joining in, you know, in living rooms with our families apart from one another, when we join our voices together, uh, it's a sweet smelling thing to God. And, and I just hope and pray that you connected with King Jesus today through the vehicle of those songs. Uh, you know, I want you to turn with me now in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, we're going to be reading verses 9 through 12 as our text this morning. First, uh, Again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. And as you're turning there, I do want to acknowledge uh, today we celebrate uh, with those around our nation, or at least remember uh, with those around our nation, uh, Memorial Day. You know, Memorial Day is different from Veterans Day in the sense that Veterans Day, uh, we celebrate in November. Uh, it, it helps us to remember those that have served in the military or currently currently serving in our services in protection of our freedoms. Memorial Day is different in the sense that it is a call to remember those who have laid the costliest of all sacrifices on the altar of freedom. Those men and women who have laid down their lives uh, in sacrifice to protect the freedoms that you and I enjoy in this nation. You know, um, this is a day of remembrance, and I just want to encourage you today to think about those that have done for you what we could not do ourselves or have not done ourselves, and to, and to, to take up arms and lay their lives down. You know, the Bible says that greater love has no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. So today we remember those who have done that for us so that we can do what we do today in worshiping King Jesus. Looking at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, the Apostle Paul is uh, sharing with the church there at Thessalonica and with us uh, an important truth that I think we need to consider here today in our culture. You know, we're living in a day, uh, I'll call it an age of outrage. Uh, it seems like everybody is mad about something. Uh, obviously, we're living in a time in our nation where we are as divided as I think that we have ever been, at least in my lifetime. You know, if you want to argue, all you have to do is bring up politics. And it doesn't even have to be a finer point of, of either particular party. It's just to express an opinion about a certain event or something that's going on. You can guarantee that you're going to be in an argument, especially on social media. You know, it seems that today we've lost the art of debate in our culture. You know, it's not, we can't simply meet with, with one another and share our opinions and, and debate the, the finer points of each one, uh, each position and come to a consensus. It, it seems that we've lost the fine art of being able to agree to disagree agreeably. You know, that's why I say we're living in an age of outrage. And that outrage is not just confined to the broader culture. We see that same feeling inside the church today. You know, we're seeing a current debate going on amongst uh, evangelical Christians in our country, and, and it's been brought on by this pandemic. You know, obviously none of us are happy about not being able to meet together in our buildings for worship. And you've got, uh, you know, several different ideas and thought processes going on simultaneously around our country about that. You know, you have some uh, leaders and churches that have expressed this as, as a sense that the government is somehow infringing on our religious liberty because they're not allowing us to meet. Other groups that would say, well, no, this is a, a, a pandemic. This is a global health issue. And, and this has nothing to do with religious freedom. It has everything to do about being safe. And, and these groups, it seems, have, have built up battle lines and, and they vilified one another, you know, and people are, are getting angry with one another inside the church because of the differing opinion about this issue. You know, and, and I think it's just symptomatic of a broader problem in our culture. We are increasingly becoming unloving. 
You know, and Paul, in writing this letter to the, the church at Thessalonica and to us, he comes in verse four and he begin, in chapter four and he begins to to talk about a life that is pleasing to God. He's he's kind of laying out at the end of his letter there to the church, kind of what a life that is pleasing to God looks like. And he begins to share with them some things that are marks, if you will, of a life that's pleasing to God. Well, then he comes to verse nine and he begins to say this. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your own hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Would you pray with me? Lord, would you come now and just teach us. Teach us how to love one another, even as we are loved by you. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would open this text, that you would help us all to see in this text what you want to, to teach us this morning and use it to change us and create in us that clean heart that's only possible through Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Paul here is, is teaching the church. He's reminding them of a message that he had obviously talked to them about before. You know, if you know anything about Paul's letters, Paul, uh, you know, he hit on a lot of different topics. But if you look at all of his letters, he always has something about loving one another or brotherly love. You see, I think for Paul and his theology, because it was based on what Jesus committed to him, love was a powerful, powerful building block to a life that honored God. In fact, I think Paul would be the first one to tell you that, you know, if you have perfect doctrine, but you don't love people, then you're deficient. He, he would say to us, if you had the perfect structure in your church, if you had the best buildings and the biggest budget, greatest programs around, but you don't love one another, it's nothing. You see, the gospel is about love. It's about God's love for us, his people, expressed in Jesus Christ coming and taking upon himself our sin and, and creating a, an opportunity for us to be made right with God. And because he first loved us, we love him. And because we love him, we love what he loves, which is other people. You know, Paul here is encouraging the Thessalonians. If, if you're going to live a life that is pleasing to God, you cannot be unloving. You know, he would say to us, it's all about the love. You know, the fact here is he's saying in verse 12 that when we live a life of love, brotherly love amongst us in the church, it accomplishes a couple of things. First, it impacts outsiders. You know, people outside the church who don't have a relationship with Christ, when they see Christians loving one another, it makes an impact on them, according to Paul. He also says that when we practice brotherly love, among, it ensures that we are not dependent on other people. You know, these are two things that happen when we prioritize brotherly love inside the church. So, so what does that look like? What does it look like to, to have a loving life that honors God? Well, Paul gives us a prescription in these verses that kind of helps us understand how we can express brotherly love as we live out the gospel in our world. The first thing that he would say to us about living a life that is filled with love that honors God, he would say that we must be intentional about it. 
We must be intentional about it. You know, he says, you guys, in verse 9, you, you know, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about brotherly love, but you have no need for anyone to write to you about this. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, for that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. You see, Paul is acknowledging the fact that the Thessalonians had a reputation for being loving. In fact, he says it's known throughout, throughout Macedonia, the whole area, the whole region knows of your love for the brothers. So, you know, he's saying that's a good thing. He says, however, don't grow complacent. You know, I think sometimes that can happen to us. You know, it's one. Yeah, I hear churches all the time talking about, hey, we're a loving church. You know, our church is a really loving church. But then you go to that church and you walk in as an outsider and you see people engaged in conversation with one another. You see people hugging one another. You see people obviously caring for one another, but no one is expressing that to you. See, I think sometimes that's what happens to churches. We, you know, we are loving to one another that are inside the church, and we become complacent in the sense of because we, we enjoy those loving relationships, we enjoy expressing that to the people that we know and are comfortable with, and so we, we, we label ourselves as loving churches, but we're only loving to the ones that are inside already. You know, I think that's kind of what Paul is saying here. He's saying you've got a reputation for, for practicing brotherly love, but don't get complacent. Do it more and more. See, you have to be intentional about expressing love. You can't grow complacent. You know, many of us are kind of like the, the man who, who uh, got married and, you know, on his 50th wedding anniversary, his wife was telling me, you know, uh, you know I, I, we've been married for 50 years and, you know, I, I just don't think you love me anymore. And, and, she said, and, and the husband said, well, what do you mean? What, what, why, why would you think that I don't love you? Well, you never tell me you love me. And he looked at her and said, woman, I told you on our wedding day 50 years ago that I love you. And if I ever change my mind, I'll let you know. You know, that man thought that he could just simply say to his bride, I love you that one time, and that covered it. He, he began to be complacent in, in that, that expression of love. And I think a lot of times that's what happens to us. That, you know, we just kind of take for granted that people know that we love them. And so we, we become less intentional about showing them. If we're going to grow in this discipline of brotherly love, we've got to be intentional. And that means that we've got to go out of our way to show people that we care. You know, and, and isn't that what love does? You know, love will cause us to, to prioritize the other person's well-being and good far beyond our own. You know, when you love someone, you're willing to do whatever's necessary for that person. You know, I can tell you right now for my family, for my wife and my daughters, I would literally lay my life down for them. And, you know, if, if, if it ever became a situation where it was my life or theirs, I would willingly say, take my life because I love them and I want them to live. I want them to thrive. See, that's, that's expressing love. You know, but love has to go beyond just being willing to give your life for someone. You know, it's not enough to, to, you know, push somebody out of the way and get hit by the bus in their place. No, we must learn how to, to love them as we live and express that the love to them in, in tangible ways. And I think as Christians, if we can learn to do that inside the house of God, you know, whether it be inside of our local church or beyond our local church, if we can learn just to love one another, it would be so attractive to those outside because they would see lives that have been changed by the love of God. You know, churches and Christians should be the most loving people in our culture. But we, you know, it's not going to happen by just saying that we are. We have to be intentional about living a life that expresses love. Paul goes on and says another characteristic of a life that's being lived in love and, and that honors God is to learn to live quietly. Learn to live quietly. You know, he says there in that verse, aspire to live 
quietly. That's talking about a striving to live a quiet lifestyle. So what does that look like? Well, I think 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10 kind of expresses what a quiet life looks like. Paul, in writing to his young ministry protege, Timothy, says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kind of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. See, I think a quiet life is a contented life life. You know, you know that you're content when it doesn't matter to you if you have a lot or if you have a little, because you've learned that the, the greatest treasures in life don't come with, with price tags. You see, unfortunately, we live in a culture that likes to define people's worth by what they have. You know, if you have a lot of money, have a, a nice home, a, a, a nice vehicle, a, want nice clothes, then somehow you are worth more than a person who doesn't have those things. You know, and, and I think that is the tragedy of the day because what that has produced in our culture is this desire to have more just so that we can make an impression on people around us because we bought into this lie that that to, to be truly significant is to be wealthy and rich. And, you know, and many people's lives are filled with turmoil and a striving and, you know, a, a pushing and a pulling simply because they feel that pressure to succeed in the way the world defines success. You know, Paul told Timothy in those verses that godliness with contentment is great gain. Basically, he was telling Timothy, Timothy, if you will put your effort in being what God has called you to be, to, you know, to, to striving to live your life in such a way that honors God, it'll never, ever matter one day to you what you have. Because you realize that the greatest blessings that God has given you are, are not material things. You know, that is a quiet life. And, you know, when we aspire as, to live that kind of life, when we stop striving to, to try to get wealthy and, you know, to step on people to get ahead so that we can make more money, when we start living a quiet life, we are really free to love people. You know, one of the antithesis of love is, is greed. Because greed causes us to, to become consumed with pride and become consumed with jealousy. You know, we, we look at people who, who might have more than we do, and, and we begin to look at them, and, and we begin to feel these feelings of, of bitterness toward them because, you know, what makes them so special? How come they get to live in that neighborhood? How come he gets to drive that pickup truck? How come he gets to, to have that position? And we start, we start looking at those people with jealousy, and we start coveting what they have, and that produces in us this tension. That's the antithesis of love. Because you see, love should be based on loving a person for who they are, not for what they have. You know, our churches and, and Christians, we should be loving to people all around us in our culture. And it shouldn't matter what they can do for us. You know, a, a big thing in churches, you know, about 20 years ago, as the, the church growth movement was in its uh, zenith, one of the things that, that uh, the church growth movement taught you was to know the demographic that your church was trying to reach. And, you know, the idea there was you want to create a profile of the, of the uh, optimal candidate for membership in your church. And basically what it taught churches to do was market themselves to people like that so that you would attract those people. And it's hilarious to me how most of the churches that, that did that, they created a profile of these, these wealthy, rich people that could do something for the church. And I'm sitting there thinking about this and, and thinking about the fallacy of that. You know, God is no respecter of persons. 
He loves the wealthy. He loves the poor. He loves the he, he loves black people, white people, Chinese people. He loves everybody, and it doesn't matter. God is no respecter of persons. And you know, church, if we're gonna love like God, we gotta stop being respecters of persons. We gotta stop. You know, looking on the outside of people to determine about whether or not they're lovable. You see, it's not the outside of the person. It's the content of their character. And you see, if we're going to truly love in a manner that's going to attract outsiders and, and, and cause people to look and say there's something different about that group of people who are following this man named Jesus, then we're going to have to start expressing a brotherly love that's not based on trying to climb a ladder somewhere, trying to prove our worth in the eyes of man. No, it needs to be about a pursuit of a quiet life that's content with what God has provided, understanding that his greatest blessing is not material things. A life like that is definitely going to produce that fruit that God wants to produce. Paul goes on and gives us another characteristic uh, of a loving life that honors God. He says, we have to learn to mind our own business. We have to mind our own business. You know, it's expressed by, by Paul to the Thessalonians as mind your own affairs. That's basically, he's saying is stop being a busybody. Stop being so consumed with what your brother's doing and, and mind your own business. You know, John, in, in chapter 21, we see this comical exchange that I think expresses this value. Uh, picking up at verse 20, you know, Jesus is walking down the beach after he was resurrected with Peter. And uh, Peter turns and he saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. The one who had also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? Now, when Peter saw him, John following, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it's my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Basically, Jesus was telling Peter to mind his own business. You know, Peter he had just been told by Jesus what kind of death he was going to die. He was going to be martyred for the faith. Jesus had told him, you know, when you're old, people are going to lead you where you do not want to go. And immediately he, he turns and he sees John. Finally, he said, hey, well, Lord, what about this guy? And, and Jesus says, Peter, just mind your own business. Follow me. You know, that's enough to preoccupy your attention. You follow me. Don't worry about what he's got to suffer. Don't worry about what he's got. You follow me. Oh my goodness, Christians. I just wish that we would all learn this principle. You know, I think that the age of social media has really created this value in us, a negative value on steroids. We are busybodies in the modern church. And unfortunately, people are complicit because they will post everything about their lives on social media. It's almost like we've created this society of voyeurism. I mean, think about it. Reality TV. Oh my goodness, you can't watch a network anymore without being inundated with reality series after reality series. And I love to say it's, it's actually an alternate reality series because most of what is being put out, that's not reality. It's a reality that's being shaped and being tweaked to fit something that they want to present. But you see, it's created this voyeuristic society that, that gives us permission, we think, to, to comment on the intimate details of anybody's life. The gospel would tell you, mind your own business. You know, if we're going to have a loving church, a church that loves one another, we got to learn to mind our own business. You know, uh, this is a, a, a real problem in, in our culture today. And I think it's really putting a black eye on the church because, you know, we are too quick to participate in gossip in the church. You know, gossip is one of those things that, you know, Jerry Bridges once wrote a book, a guy named Jerry, he wrote a book called Respectable Sins. And basically in Jerry Bridges' book, he was pointing out how there are certain things in the church that we will tolerate while other things we won't. 
You know, we'll call out the big sins. But there are certain sins that, that have become, in our eyes, at least by our action or inaction, have become respectable. And so we kind of tolerate them in the church. And gossip is the number one thing on the list. And you know, gossip will destroy a church. You know, when you have people that are talking about other people, you know, here, here's a good rule of thumb. If somebody comes up to you and says, hey, let me tell you about this about this person. You want to stop it in its tracks? Say them, tell you what, time out. Let's go get them and bring them over here, and then we can talk about it. And you might say, well, that might offend someone. Well, maybe we should be more offended at the fact that we're sharing intimate details about one another to other people. Maybe that should offend us, because it certainly offends God. You know, that's what we have to learn. If we're going to truly love one another, we got to refuse to gossip. We got to refuse to to speak about people behind their backs. In fact, we've got to def learn to defend one another. You know, I give you permission to do this. The next time someone comes up to you in this church and says, "Hey, let me tell you about this person," bring them to me. You see, we've got to stop this in its tracks, because if we don't, then we are not loving one another. We can say we're a loving church all we want to, but if we are practicing gossip inside the church, then we're not loving one another like Christ has loved us. So let's learn to mind our own business. The final thing that he, he points out to us about a life that is growing in this, this, this characteristic of brotherly love, he, he tells the church there at Thessalonica that they are to work with their own hands. Now you might be thinking, what's that got to do about loving people? How how is it loving learning to love others when I'm I'm you know learning to work with my own hands? Well you see, being a follower of Jesus means that we should be the best employees at our companies. Because our work ethic should be just out of this world because we understand that ultimately what we are doing, we're doing unto the Lord. We are working in our secular jobs, but we're not just doing it for a paycheck. We're not just doing it for an earthly boss. What we're doing, we're doing unto the Lord. How would that change how you treat customers where you work? How would that change how you treat your coworkers? If you began to look at what you do, you're doing it not just to men. You're doing it unto the Lord. You know, how would that, you know, it should drastically impact our work, uh, you know, our, 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 our uh, you know, our, our theology of work. It should impact how we, our, our ethic of work. And, you know, that's so important in this aspect of learning to love others. Because you see, when I, have a good work ethic. That means that I'm loving my fellow workers enough to make sure that they're not having to pick up my slack. That I'm doing my work and I'm doing everything I'm supposed to probably, and plus a little bit more because I don't want anyone else to have to take up my slack. I don't want to be dependent on anybody else to do what I'm supposed to do. Because I love God and I want to express my love for God and my love for other people by being the very best laborer that I can be. You know, church, think about that. What impact would that have on outsiders as they see us serving God by doing our best at what we do? You know, Paul here gives us some really practical uh, instruction on how to express brotherly love to one another inside the church. And friends, I, I truly believe if we began to walk in these things that Paul has commanded us to do, if, if we're intentional with our love, if, if we live a quiet life, if, if we mind our own business, and, and if we have uh, this great work ethic that we're working with our own hands, I believe that as we let those qualities grow in us, as we express our brotherly love one to another, I believe that it's really going to cause some people out in the world to take note and to say, you know what? I don't know what that person has, 
but whatever it is, I want it because, you know, there's just something different about their lives. You know, that's what it means to live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, it's not enough just to say that we're a Christian. We have to actually be one. We actually have to allow our lives to be transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, to become loving, you know, you don't just simply say, I'm going to discipline myself and work really hard to become loving. You can't make yourself more loving. It's something that happens to you. And, you know, I truly believe that as we go deeper in our relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God begins to change us from the inside out. The orientation of our lives is being shifted from self to God. And as that happens, we become less selfish. We become less, you know, less bitter and angry and, and, and jealous and covetous. We become less of those things. And as we're growing and becoming like Jesus, oh man, Jesus is the personification of love. As we become more like him, then by nature we begin to love others as Christ has loved us. Church, I want to encourage you. In just a, a few weeks, we're going to be able to once again meet together, we hope. And we're going to be able to, to renew the bonds of fellowship that have bound this church together and you know and and we're going to be able to to hug one another again at some point you know i don't know exactly how quickly that's going to come back because of you know the social distancing rules and everything that we're going to need to adhere to but you know at some point we're going to be able to to express our love for each other the way we've always done here at cornerstone friends let's not just be a loving church Let's not just be a loving church in reputation, but let's be a loving church in practice. Let, let the world look at us and see these qualities that Paul has pointed out to the Thessalonican church and let, let, those, let them see those qualities growing in us so that we are, are able to, to, to be able to be said of us, those people truly know Jesus. Friend, this morning, do you know him? Do, do you know Christ? You know, it's not enough for us to, to try to, to go on this, this issue of moral improvement and make ourselves better people. You know, the gospel is not about you making yourself better. The gospel is about an acknowledgement that you are completely undone by your sin and that God loved you so much that he would send his one and only son to bear for you, what you could never do for yourself, the cross. You know, the gospel is about what God has done for you. It's about what Christ has done for you. And this morning, I want to invite you, if you've never given your heart to Christ, if you've never said, I want Jesus to be my Lord, will you invite him to be your Lord today? Would you surrender your life to him? See, that's the beginning of truly understanding what love is all about. You know, I truly believe that, you know, love is from God. However it's expressed, it's from God. And for us to truly understand love, not the broken pictures of love that our culture tries to project. You know, the, the, the idea of love has been so um, fractured and so distorted in our culture that we don't even know what it means to love anymore until we meet Christ. And we see in his eyes the deep love that he has for us. A love that's not based on what we can do for him. A love that's not based on, on us cleaning ourselves up and, and improving ourselves. It's a love that's based on, on just the fact that who he is and who we are. We are as deeply loved children. Friend, God loves you. He's not ashamed of you. He's not embarrassed by you. He wants to, you to spend the rest of your life walking with him so that this brotherly love that we've talked about this morning can be flowing through your life so that others out there who've not had this opportunity to come to Christ, who've not, who don't have that relationship, they can see that love, the love of God expressed through you. Friends, let's make sure that Cornerstone Community Church 
is that vessel, that conduit, if you will, that God's love flows through and reaches our community so that people can say about us, those people truly know God. Would you pray with me? Father, I just thank you so much for this passage of Scripture, and I just pray, Lord, that we would become this kind of of people and, and that Cornerstone would be this kind of church that doesn't just love in word, but we love in deed. And that we are expressing your love for your world as we love one another. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just continue to do a work in us. Continue, Lord God, to encourage us to become everything that you said that we are through Christ. I thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity to preach your word today. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would use it for your glory. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so very much for joining us this morning. Again, if you haven't had an opportunity yet, please go to our GiveLify app to give your tithes and offerings. You know, uh, we really appreciate you being diligent in that over these last of now 11 weeks. And God has really blessed our church financially because you have been faithful in, in worshiping the King through the giving of your tithes and offerings. As always, if you don't use online giving, uh, you can always come by the church and drop off your tithes and offerings at our normal office hours. You know, we're here. Uh, Monday through Thursday right now from 9 to 12. Uh, We're going to be expanding those office hours here very shortly. We'll be back to normal operating hours. So just uh, stay in touch with us through our church Facebook page and our email thread. We'll try to get as much information out to you as we can. Obviously, in the next couple of weeks, you're going to be seeing some things change around here as we open back up. We'll be communicating with you this week. Don't forget to check out a Zoom life group this week. You can go to our website and, and find out uh, those group times and whatnot and, and make sure that you can join in on the, the Zoom groups. Again, they'll be, be returning to in-person groups very shortly, so stay tuned. Uh, also, don't miss uh, Rabbit Trails with Pastor Randall on Tuesday nights at 7. You can find that on our Facebook page. Uh, we'll be looking forward to that next installment this coming Tuesday night. Again, thank you so very much for joining us today. May God richly bless you this week.